Um, good afternoon. My name is Kyotaro Tsutsui. I'm um, the Associate Director of Center for Japanese Studies, Associate Professor in the Sociology Department here. Uh, before introducing our, our speaker today, I have a couple of announcements I need to make. Um, one, information sessions for foreign language and area studies fellowships for summer 2016 and academic year 2016-17 will be held on Wednesday, November 11th at noon and Monday, December 7th at uh, 4 p.m. in this room. Okay. Uh, two, application for the Ito Foundation Scholarship is due Monday, November 16th. For more information about this scholarship and application materials, uh, please see the CGS website in the student funding section under the academics tab. Okay. Um, today, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce Professor McLaughlin. Uh, she is Associate Professor of Government and Asian Studies um, and Mitsubishi Heavy Industries Professor of Japanese Studies at the University of Texas, uh, Austin. She's a foremost expert on Japanese politics, particularly on consumerism and consumption in Japan, uh, intergroup politics, and structural reforms such as the uh, postal, uh, the privatization of the postal system in under Koizumi, and now the agricultural cooperative system uh, under Prime Minister Abe. She earned her PhD in comparative politics at Columbia University uh, with distinction and has taught at or um, had affiliations uh, research appointment at Harvard University, Oxford University, Keio University in Japan, Rikyo University in Japan, University of Calgary in Canada, and has been at Texas since 1997. Her book, her first book, came out in 2002 from Columbia University Press is Consumer Politics in Post-War Japan, The Institutional Boundaries of Citizen Activism. She has also published an edited volume co-edited with Sheldon Garon, the historian, uh, The Ambivalent Consumer, Questioning Consumption in East Asia and the West, uh, in 2006 from Cornell University Press. And her most recent book uh, came out in 2011 from Harvard University Press, is the People's Post Office, the History and Politics of the Japanese Postal System, 1871 to 2010. She has also published a number of journal articles, book chapters, book reviews, uh, and received various awards, grants, uh, honors, and other recognitions from prestigious universities and foundations such as Harvard, Stanford, Columbia, uh, the Japan Foundation, Social Science Research Council, uh, and so on. Today, as we head to what seems like the final uh, stage, stages of uh, negotiation for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, the trade agreement, um, the specter of competition from cheaper um, agricultural products uh, from above, abroad rises further in Japan uh, and in conjunction with the democratic, demographic pressure that Japanese uh, farmers are facing, the aging uh, farmers' population, uh, really pushing the Japanese agricultural industry to reform itself, and how are local farmers adapting to these um, uh, changing environments, and how does the uh, powerful farm lobby uh, respond to this structural pressure, uh, and how is the seemingly confident uh, other administration using this, this pivotal moment as leverage to um, execute a structural reform in the most entrenched um, interest group in Japan, arguably the most entrenched interest group in Japan, the NOKO, uh, or the Agricultural Cooperative System. Uh, we are privileged to have Professor McLachlan share her insights into these questions uh, based on her recent field work and uh, building on her research and past research on Japanese interest groups, uh, lobbying, state so society relationships, and uh, structural reforms. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Patricia McLachlan. Uh, thank you all for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I actually visited the University of Michigan about 15 years ago, and I was very pregnant at the time, so there's been a lot of water under the bridge since I was last here. Anyway, it's really fun to see some familiar faces, some surprises, 
Um, and I'm looking forward to getting to know some more uh, folks while I'm here. So it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm actually going to talk about a topic today that's rather new for me. Um, I've started work on this uh, just about 18 months ago in collaboration with the young scholar pictured here. This is Keishi Mizu. Um, Keishi Mizu is a political scientist of Japan and China, formerly of the University, uh, Columbia University. She's now at the University of Pittsburgh, and she is my right hand person um, in Tokyo right now on an Abe fellowship. So we're about to embark on a book project. We're going to write a book. Um, and I want to take a slice of what we're thinking about right now and present it to you today. And I do so as a work in progress. And I welcome your feedback um, as I proceed. Um, and the bottom line for me in talking about agriculture today is that this is a story about change which might surprise a lot of people because when we talk about Nokyo or JA, as I'm going to refer to it today, we normally think about resistance to change, stubborn resistance to change. But as a result of extensive field work in a number of agricultural sites around Japan, our discussions with farmers, co-op leaders, um, local government officials, as well as bureaucrats and politicians at the national level and other scholars, we see a somewhat different story. We see significant change coming from directions that might be surprising. Um, although this isn't going to be the main focus of my talk today, um, the underlying theme will be a lot of the impetus for change is not just happening within the government and amongst people in authority. It's really happening from the rice roots up, from farmers themselves. And that will be a significant part of my story today. Um, what I'd like to do is focus my remarks on what I think is a surprise. Something happened a few weeks ago and I want to explain it. At the end of August of this year, um, uh, something very surprising happened, and that is that the Abe government passed legislation through the Diet that will significantly change the power that Japan agricultural cooperatives, otherwise known as Nokyo, it's now known as uh, JA since 1993, have over local farmers and co-ops. Um, although this isn't an earth-chattering change, the structure of Nokyo, as I'll explain in a few moments, is going to stay more or less the same, but it's stranglehold over what happens in the farm is going to be significantly loosened. And this is a surprise. This is a sacred cow in Japan, by uh, all intents and purposes. Um, this is the first time in six decades that the government has enacted any, any change whatsoever to the agricultural cooperatives law. In fact, it's the first time in as many decades that the issue of co-op reform has even been on the government agenda. So this is a puzzle to a lot of us that needs to be explained. Before I do that, though, let me give you a little bit of background information on what JA is and how it works and why it's so controversial. When we talk about Nokyo or the JA group more correctly now, they use that term in Japanese as well as English. We're talking about a three-tiered organization that acts like a very corporativist interest group. And it's a multifunctional interest group association that performs all manner of functions from finance to business functions for the farmer at the local level. At the top are a group of about five national associations and two of them are going to be the focus of my remarks today. The first is called Zeno, um, which is the business association of JA. This is the organization that networks around the country through prefectural and local co-ops to provide business inputs to farmers like fertilizers and pesticides. It also collects a lot of produce, particularly rice, and distributes it to market and is in charge of marketing that product that is eventually purchased by the consumer. Um, it, is, uh, it has enjoyed through the years a near monopoly of some of these functions, although now I think it would be correctly viewed as part of an oligopolistic economic sector. And some of this will become a little more apparent later on. The other major organization within the JA co-op network, which I think is even more important for our purposes, is Zenchu. And this is the political arm. This is the shireto, or the political control tower of the entire JA edifice that acts as the co-op network's political representative in um, uh, political lobbying with the bureaucracy um, and with politicians. Um, JA also has an 
agri uh, an electoral arm that helps the farmers collect the vote behind largely liberal democratic politicians, as we'll see. Um, those are the two most important organizations, but there are others, and um, most significantly there's a large network at the national level that provides insurance to farmers, and there's also a massive bank, one of Japan's largest bank, second perhaps only to the post office bank. Um, one of the, the country's largest banks, um, and a lot of farmers um, are forced to use the bank, as we'll see. Um, that is not on the uh, reform agenda. I'm going to focus mostly on Zenno and Zenchu today. There are also uh, chapters of these five associations at the prefectural level, and at the local level, there's a network of just under 700 local cooperatives to which most farmers, almost all farmers belong. Um, by default, it's almost a compulsory, member compulsory membership. This number has decreased over the years in response to first municipal amalgamations, particularly in the 80s and 90s and JA has followed suit by amalgamating, merging co-ops at the local level. There used to be several thousand, now we're down to just under 700. Now, these, this network uh, implements top-down controls from the bottom, uh, from the top down to the local level. Um, it it's a responsible for mobilizing the rural vote behind conservative politicians. Um, Zenchu, the political arm, has served as a powerful lobbyist for farmers, representing lobby uh, farmers as we've seen in the political system. And not surprisingly, it is this edifice that is so responsible for serving as a break on reform. This is a group that's very, very protective of the agricultural status quo, and they are loath to see any kind of change whatsoever. This is what prime ministers are afraid of when they talk about JA reform being a, a taboo subject. If you go too far, politicians in the past can risk losing traction uh, in the electoral system. There have been a number of criticisms of JA. Um, some of them go something like this, and they're all true. JA inflates prices of inputs for farmers. Um, they charge higher than market service fees for services rendered, the collection and distribution of farmland produce. Um, and this is bad for the costs faced by farmers, and it's also bad for the prices paid by consumers in the supermarkets. It also breeds economic inefficiency by encouraging uh, small-scale part-time farmers to stay on the farm. Part-time farmers who now, in 1990, outnumbered full-time farmers by more than five to one are farmers that make 50 percent or more of their income from off-farm employment, and their farms tend to be extremely small. Part-time farmers just so happen to be the core of customers for JA services, particularly its financial services, which are now the biggest profit maker for the JA group, more so than Zeno. Um, so it's, very, it's in JA's interest to keep as many of these farmers on the land as possible, and not coincidentally, the more farmers there are, the more potential voters there are to mobilize behind sympathetic um, politicians who are endorsed by JA. So for all intents and purposes, JA, rightly so, has often been criticized by acting more like a self-interest, profit-oriented business than an actual agricultural cooperative who is supposed to be in the business of serving the interests of farmers and serving the long-term viability of agriculture more generally. So what's going to change as of these, because of these uh, inter, uh, new legislation that was enacted just a few weeks ago? Um, three main groups of changes insofar as JA is concerned. First of all, Zenchu is going to lose its authority to obligate co-ops to submit to its auditing functions. Um, and that was a major source of top-down uh, uh, JA control over the farmers. Now farmers will be free to go to the private market and be audited by private um, certified public accountants. And as JA loses that function, and this is a Zenchu function, it will also <coughs> lose the power to uh, extract levies from local co-ops, which it's used to serve its lobbying functions and its electoral functions. It's also going to become uh, an incorporated uh, association, like an Ipan Shadan Hojin, just like any other trade association, which is expected to decrease some of its long-term economic and political power. 
Zendo, some of the changes weren't as extensive as originally um, suspected, um, but there are a number of steps that are being put into place which will encourage Zendo over time to become like any other um, joint stock company. And if this happens, and it might, um, this will deprive Zeno of, of its many anti-monopoly law exemptions, which allow it to um, exercise such important oligopolistic controls within the agricultural sector as an economic sector. Also, Zeno is going to be prohibited from now on enforcing, from forcing farmers to submit to JA services. Before Geno, uh, Z, uh, JA and Zeno in particular functioned almost like the, the town company or the company store, um, it would uh, inform in no uncertain terms farmers that in order to receive government subsidies, which JA would channel from the Ministry of Agriculture down into the local level, um, that it would have to go into uh, JA bank um, uh, uh, accounts, which meant that all farmers would have to have JA accounts in order to receive the subsidies. So there are a number of different kind of kit sticks and carrots used by Zenno to make sure that Zenno was used by the farmers throughout the farming process. That is no longer going to be possible for Zenno. It will apparently be against the law. Finally, at the local level, the co-ops, um, which are often controlled to a significant degree by part-time farming interests, will now have to consist of a majority of full-time farmers, so-called core farmers who've been recognized by their local governments as being viable, long -ter long -ter in a long-term sense, profitable, um, large-scale full-time farmers. No longer will part-time farmers be able to dominate these co-ops. There are a number of other changes that were also introduced. One of them will be to the Nogyo Iinkai, or the Agricultural Committees, um, which are elected municipal committees that are in charge of the transfer of farmland use rights. And they tend to be very, very conservative, and in the past controlled by very um, status quo oriented, often part-time farming interests. Now these uh, uh, organizations as well will not be elected. They'll now be appointed by municipal mayors, and a majority of those directorships will also have to be core farmers rather than part-time farmers. And then finally, there's been a change to the agricultural land law, which will raise the ceiling on the amount of land which non-farm corporate entities like Lawson's or supermarkets can actually own. Um, farmland. Uh, is, these companies want to buy up farmland. There's a 25 percent ceiling within so-called agricultural production corporations. That will be raised from 25 percent to nearly 50 percent, which means we'll see a larger corporate presence within the agricultural sphere in the years ahead. So the significance of these reforms are manyfold. The ones that are glaring to me is that they promise, if not guarantee, at least promise to strengthen the forces of competition within the agricultural sector by freeing up local co-ops and farmers to, spawn, to respond more directly to consumer demand and other market forces after many, many years of significant domination by JA in a way that tends to be largely market displacing. They'll also uh, in decrease the influence of economically inefficient part-time farmers within the co-op system. And along with the other legislative amendments that were introduced at the end of August, they'll also encourage more la land consolidation, the formation of larger farms in Japan, which will encourage the growth of large-scale, more efficient, full-time farmers. So with all that in mind, the main questions that I want to look at in the, the remainder of this talk are twofold. First of all, why now? Why did the Abe government step up to the plate at this stage to introduce these changes when no other prime minister before Abe Shinzo has dared to go near them? What's different? What's new? What explains the fact that this issue is even on the agenda in the first place? And then my second related question is going to be, why successful? Why, you know, it's one thing to take up the issue, it's another thing to succeed. So what can we say about the system today that enabled Abe Shinzo to put f uh, through, to uh, ram through a, a number of these changes with some modification and some wa watering down granted, but nevertheless, again, this is the first time in six decades that JA has been subjected to significant reform. So those are the two questions that I want to look at. Um, and starting with the first question, um, let me give you an alternative explanation. 
if we were having this conversation two decades ago, why is there change in the agricultural sector? The argument would probably focus on the role of outside pressure, of gaiatsu, probably from the United States. It's because of overwhelming pressure from the outside that the Japanese government feels it has no choice but to succumb to changes and to force local farmers to go along with them. There are precedents for this. First of all, if, as Kent Calder uh, has pointed out in the past, if you go and look at the opening of the beef and oranges market in the 1980s, yes, indeed, it was the case that Japanese farmers and the government at the time were under extraordinary pressure from American trade negotiators who wanted to open up this, these particular markets. And they succeeded. And they succeeded in part, argued Calder at the time, because of a commonality of interest groups between the United States and Japan. There were exporters and farmers within the United States that wanted access to the Japanese markets. And there were business people in the export-import import market within Japan who were eager to partner with them. And they saw business opportunities here. And that is ultimately ultimately what ran through these particular very unpopular changes amongst Japanese farmers. More recently, in the mid-1990s, Japan opened up its notoriously closed rice market. Not completely, but certainly significantly. And the reason there, as scholars like Christina Davis have convincingly explained in partnership with Jennifer O, oh, has to do with the role of the agricultural agreement, which was signed by Japan during the Uruguay round of trade negotiations under the GATT at the time, now the WTO. Um, that agreement obligated Japan to engage in a number of reforms. It had no choice. As a result, it got rid of its old food, food staple uh, control law and it partially liberalized rice, um, rice markets. And the reason there, she argues, I think correctly, was that there was a monitoring agency in place in the form of the WTO, which obligated Japan to change and made sure that Japan complied with its promise to change and oversaw the implementation process. So one argument that might come up today, particularly today, TPP, by the way, has just been made public. It's now, or at least it's available to Congress for the first time, just over the last couple of hours, apparently. Um, Congress members will be able to go into a closed room and actually read this agreement. Um, and it would be very, I think, reasonable to assume that Japan is doing something very similar with TPP that it did with the, the agricultural agreement. It foresees this huge agricultural agreement and therefore that agreement is somehow convincing the Japanese that it must engage no matter what in these otherwise very, very unpopular reforms. Well, my colleague and I, Kei Shimizu, thinks that this is wrong. The TPP does not serve this purpose for a number of reasons. First of all, throughout the negotiation stage of JA reform, the outcome of TPP was extremely uncertain. Even at the time of passage of the legislation, it was not a done deal. It's still not a done deal. There is an agreement, but it still has to be ratified by 12 countries, and it could very well be railroaded by the United States, if ruminations out of Congress this morning are any indication. So um, the compelling nature of the agricultural agreement in the past is not being duplicated in TPP. There's nothing comparable. TPP does not obligate farmers to change. It does not obligate the government to introduce uh, unpopular reforms in the agricultural sector. Also, even if TPP does see the light of day for the Japanese, um, Japan has secured a number of concessions for key sectors, the so-called five sacred items, which are rice, rice foremost, wheat and pork, uh, beef and sugar, dairy, beef and pork, no, excuse me, rice, wheat and barley, beef and pork, dairy and sugar. Um, there have been some concessions for farmers to ease their entry into what should otherwise be free markets in the trade of these sectors. And those, those uh, um, concessions are apparently quite significant. Finally, there is no um, evidence that Abe himself linked the two issues together. At no time in his policy proclamations, did the government say to farmers and to co-ops, we must do this or we will fail at TPP, or we will not do well in the international stage? That was never part of the arguments coming out of the government, at least to our knowledge so far. And we've combed a lot of policy statements and media statements looking for this kind of evidence. So what you might ask is actually causing this problem. As Professor Tsutsui hinted, 
we think it's demographic, it's largely domestic and demographic. We argue that, TP, that uh, JA reform and agricultural reform more generally would be on the agenda in Japan with or without TPP because of very, very strong, increasingly strong domestic incentives to engage in reform. In fact, the more time goes by, the more this becomes an extraordinary crisis. And let me explain. First of all, as we all know, farmers are rapidly aging. They're decreasing in number and they're getting older and older and older. 23% of the population in 2010 was age 65 or over. That's the general population. But the corresponding rate for commercial farmers was a staggering 61.6%. That's nearly two-thirds. That number went up an additional 22% uh, by 2014 to 63.6%. So nearly two-thirds of all farmers are over the age of 65. That's a problem. And the flip side of the aging farmer problem is a severe crisis of successors. There's a shortage of successors. No one to take over the family farm. Now, with a few minor exceptions, there's very little data coming out of the government that actually shows us um, decisively the scope of the successor issue. But I think this particular um, 2009 uh, agricultural ministry survey might give you a hint, and this is kind of viewed as a proxy for just how bad is it. Farmers were asked extensively throughout the country, there were several thousand farmers interviewed here, um, uh, how are you doing your work? Are you farming alone, which suggests there's no one there to help you, or mostly alone, which means there's nobody there to help you of any significance? Um, is your son or daughter um, actually working with you? Uh, and if so, are you just sort of kicking back as the owner of this farm and watching your son and daughter do the job? Well, as it turns out, it turns 50% uh, of farmers um, within Japan age 75 or over, as you can see from the top line, do not have anyone on the farm at the current time to take over that farm. So they're farming alone or with perhaps a little bit of temporary help from other farm members, probably a farmer's wife. So 50% of farmers, this is a rough guesstimate of how bad the successor issue uh, is, 50% of farmers age 75 or older don't have anyone to take over the farm. And when they die, it's very likely that that farmland, all other things being equal, if there's no owner in the city somewhere to take over it, um, will be, become abandoned land in Japan. And today, abandoned farmland, the scope of it, is fully one and a half uh, times the size of metropolitan Tokyo. So not only is land not being succeeded through the generations the way it used to, um, when it fails to find a successor, um, a lot of land is being let go fallow um, indefinitely, which is a waste, particularly for a country with a very, very small amount of agricultural farmland, arable land. The problem is that attracting young blood to the soil in Japan has become increasingly difficult because the family farm, the vaunted traditional family farm, or noka, is no longer profitable, or at least not the way it used to be. And there are a number of problems contributing to this. The demand for rice is going steadily down. It's been cut roughly in half since the early 1960s. As uh, populations get older, they eat less, and they eat less rice. That, combined with the diversification of the Japanese diet, has cut the demand for rice virtually in half. And yet, the number of rice farmers has not declined commensurately. In fact, it remains roughly 70% of all Japanese farmers. Also, the rice price has declined since that opening of the agricultural market in the mid-1990s. Prices have plummeted steadily since the 1990s, including just over the last couple of years. And meanwhile, the price of farm inputs is going steadily up, thanks in part to JA. It's no longer easy to make a profit on the land as it used to be, at least not as easy as it used to be in the past. So agricultural incomes are cut roughly in half over the past generation. Small wonder that the son or daughter of an aging farmer is not terribly eager to come back to the farm and take over the family business. Um, we interviewed a number of farmers on this issue, and the successor issue is by far their most pressing concern, far more than TPP, which is still a big unknown. It makes Japanese farmers nervous, but it's far less certain than the certainty of the successor issue. 
And let me just read from a quotation of one of our, our informants in Kumamoto City, this older farmer who said, those of us who were farming 40 or 50 years ago could expect to lead a decent life. Our jobs were interesting, we made money, and there was certainly no successor problem on the horizon. We all felt that if you worked hard, you could do okay. Then the economic bubble hit, and suddenly costs really increase, and our efforts seemed to yield fewer rewards. Things went steadily downhill from there. Fewer and fewer people were prepared to put out for farming, claiming that they just hadn't, didn't have it in them to do the job, yaruki ganai. And as a successor problem grew more and more apparent, we began to fear not only for our farms, but also for our communities. It's a big problem. Even if the price of rice were propped up and the, the uh, price of farm inputs was decreased, um, there would still be a significant number of problems facing potential successors of farms today. And that's because the size of farms tends to be far, more too, far too small for farmers to gain a, an efficient economy of scale. The average farm size in Japan is just two hectares. That's about two and a half acres. Uh, no, uh, five acres, two and a half acres per hectare. And that's 120th the size of the average farm size in France, 120th the average farm size in Japan. And it's a reflection of the fact that small-time, small-scale part-time farmers still do dominate the agricultural landscape in Japan. Um, there are impediments to land consolidation, legal impediments and political impediments. Those agricultural committees that I highlighted for you earlier are probably the main building block or the main block uh, to the uh, amalgamation of land in Japan. It's hard for farms to get bigger. But we know that the bigger the farm, the more likely the revenue stream is going to be larger and the greater the profit from that farm will be. And some of this is borne out from some smaller scale um, surveys that have been conducted by the MAF in recent years. One of these surveyed about 1,000 farmers in uh, operating farms near urban areas. Um, and we discovered uh, through this uh, survey that the more revenue that the farm made, the more likely the farmer had secured a successor to take over the farm once that farmer retired. So the question, um, the, con or the conclusion that farmers are making as a result of this demographic crisis, which gets deeper and deeper as time goes on, is that farmers, bureaucrats, politicians, and even some local co-ops are recognizing if we want to attract more young people to the soil, we're going to have to make farms more profitable. And for farms to be more profitable, more opportunities must be given to farmers to react more directly to consumer demand and to other market signals. Now, market-oriented reform will undoubtedly help farmers compete in a more globalized economy, and that's certainly one of the aims of the Abe government. But these reforms would likely be on the table even if TPP were not a topic of discussion today. So while the agricultural crisis in general has given farmers an incentive to tolerate reform and politicians an incentive to ram it through, other things are happening in Japan that have made it possible for Abe not only to put this issue on the agenda, but actually to usher it successfully, successfully through the diet in a way that has surprised many onlookers of Japan. So moving on to my second question, how can we explain the success of Japan, of Abe's undertaking in recent months. And here we talk about, we have to talk about a political story rather than a demographic story. In the past, as I'm sure many of you have known, many of you know, um, politics and agriculture was controlled um, overwhelmingly by a tightly knit iron triangle or sub-government. I call it a regime because what I'm about to explain also presupposes a commonality of policy preferences. Um, and that regime uh, consists of three power centers in Japan. The Agricultural Ministry, the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries, the Liberal Democratic Party throughout the era of one-party dominance, and JA or Nokyo itself. Those three groups have colluded to a significant degree to keep prices high, markets closed, and subsidies flowing to local farmers. And we know that farmers are voters who help keep the Liberal Democratic Party in power. 
The key link in that regime used to be an, uh, a political exchange relationship between the farmers themselves and JA and the Liberal Democratic Party in which the co-ops would mobilize in its heyday as many as one million votes behind sympathetic farmers within the Liberal Democratic Party. And in return for the delivery of those votes, the LDP would promise protective policy, particularly, let's keep those prices high through subsidies, producer supports, and particularly keeping markets close to outside imports. Today, the unity of that regime is breaking down. The unity of each of the three component parts is breaking down significantly. There's dissension within each group, more diversity of interest within each group, and also the ties that bind the three groups together into an overwhelming iron triangle have also significantly deteriorated. This was a picture taken of then General Secretary of LDP, this is in 2013, shaking hands with the head of Zenchu, Mr. Banzai Akira, who um, ended up resigning his position when the JA legislation was finally rammed through over the summer. Um, but this shows, uh, this is a very public statement and expression of affection between the two sides that shows, even though what I'm about to tell you is a story of change, even today, the LDP continues to pay significant attention to the wishes of JA. But this, again, is changing. And here's what's going on. Um, very quickly, demographic change is changing the power, weakening the power of the mobilized agricultural vote. The number of farmer voters is steadily shrinking because of the f declining farm population in both relative and absolute terms. There's been an ideolog uh, ideological change within the LDP, within the agricultural ministry, and even amongst farmers themselves. No longer do all of these groups seem to be in unison with one another and with each other. Um, that the old regime and the policies which undergirded it um, need to remain in place. Instead, there are more and more voices saying that reform is necessary. And that reform movement in particular um, has resulted in reforms throughout the uh, political economy in Japan, certainly under Koizumi, and Abe Shinzo seems to be riding that wave as well. Electoral change certainly has changed or weakened the agricultural regime. The 1990 reforms to the rules of the lower house have uh, weakened significantly the power of the organized vote. Groups like JA, who in the past were able to mobilize as many as one million and sometimes even more votes behind um, sympathetic politicians. There's also been a simultaneous movement over time toward more proactive executive leadership thanks to institutional changes introduced during the 1990s by Hashimoto Ryutaro, which have uh, strengthened the institutions of the executive branch of government, or the Kante, the Prime Minister's Office for short. Um, all of these changes have uh, made it possible for prime ministers, particularly more recently, to not simply wait around for Gaiatsu to make changes. They realize that there are new opportunities in this disintegrating regime in which politicians themselves can take the initiative um, and uh, institute some rather significant reform. But where I'd like to spend the, the, line, the rest of the remainder of my talk on are on changes within JA and amongst farmers themselves. What uh, Kei Shimizu and I are really focusing on is that we see a lot of changes happening within JA itself and the grip even before August 2015 that JA has over local co-ops and local farmers. These changes are the result of cumulative reforms, very small scale reforms that seemed insignificant at the time, but the cumulative result of them over the course of a generation have been new opportunities for farmers and innovative co-ops to do new things and to even break away from the JA mold. For example, as a result of deregulation, Zenno is no longer the monopoly that it used to be in terms of providing business services for farmers. Now it faces stiff competition from other contenders in the market, not least big box home improvement uh, box uh, uh, stores, the equivalent of Japan's Home Depot, which can provide fertilizers and pesticides far more cheaply to farmers than Zenno ever could. So Zenno's lure as a business provider has been weakened significantly as a result of these changes. And there are a number of other examples of this as well. Um, there have also been some small-scale loosenings of the barriers to land consolidation over time. Farms are still too small, but they're getting ever so slowly larger and larger and larger. 
And the number of larger farms are increasing in number in very noteworthy ways in recent years. At the grassroots level, um, we've discovered and seen for ourselves at the local level that these reforms, particularly within the JA infrastructure, have in turn provided local farmers and co-ops with expanded opportunities to break away from the JA group and to innovate in ways that are very market oriented and very surprising for those of us who assume that agriculture in Japan is all about protectionism um, and make, uh, providing social welfare services to farmers. And here are just a few examples. The rate of incorporation of family farms has increased uh, rather dramatically in recent years. More and more farms are turning themselves into businesses, which means that the finances of the household um, are now separate from that of the farm itself, even though the household is still the owner of the farmland on which that farm is located. Some of these farms are now bypassing Zeno, and they're selling their product directly to market. Uh, some of them even have direct relationships with um, vendors, with retailers, with supermarkets, and with restaurant chains. And more and more of these examples are becoming apparent um, at the local level. Um, incorporation allows farms to hire outside labor um, and also enables these farms to become more profitable, which makes it easier for these farms to secure successors. We've also seen really interesting trends in what's called in the United States, and the Japan, Japanese have their equivalent, community-supported agriculture, or shuraku eno. And these are large sort of co-ops, a new kind of folk co-op outside of the JA network, in which all of the small-scale farms within a particular hamlet, or shuraku, will pool their land within one organizational structure, and they'll either receive help from that structure and the administrators of it in the tilling of their land, or they'll cede the entire responsibility for cultivation to those local new farm management systems. More and more local farms are engaging in shuraku eno. It has made their farms more profitable. The shuraku eno often will sell their product directly to market, sometimes through JA, sometimes directly through market and in ways that are far more profitable. So again, this is a way that does several things of significance for our purposes. First of all, it enables the farmer without a successor or with a successor that lives in the city who doesn't want to come back to the farm, a way to keep that farm tilled while the farmer nears uh, a retirement or even beyond. Um, and it also makes those farms far more um, uh, profitable. We've also seen a slow but steady increase in the number of non-farm corporate participation in agriculture. Convenience stores like Lawson's are now contracting with individual farmers at the local level to um, uh, enable those farms to supply exclusively for Lawson's or for 7-Eleven has one like these. A number of large department store uh, supermarkets and other food vendors um, are buying up land or contracting with farmers in order to enable um, direct uh, chains of supply from the countryside into um, these supermarkets. And that's a major change. Bypasses the JA system to a significant degree and uh, makes the produce cheaper for the purchaser, Lawson's or the supermarket, and also more profitable for the seller, the farmer. Some innovative farmers are completely bypassing local co-ops. Others are cooperating with local co-ops, and we discovered a number of these in Kumamoto City in 2014. Um, one in particular called Agura, Aguri Tomoai um, created the Shuraku Eno, a community-supported agriculture uh, entity. And it used the local JA as its prime investor in this new venture. Um, and that gave it a stable supply of investment funds. And for the first time in decades, uh, or several years anyway, this particular agricultural entity has been able to turn a profit for a number of its farmers. So sometimes we see cooperation between the co-ops and these innovative farmers. We've also seen examples of co-ops completely breaking away from the JA system. And there are a number of these have, that have done so. One of them, a famous one called JA Echizen Takefu, has completely bypassed JA to sell its rice directly to the market. So what we're seeing as a result of this grassroots um, uh, research is that farming today looks much, much different than it did a generation ago. More and more farmers 
um, are, are farming in ways that turn a profit for themselves. They're breaking away from JA. And in the meantime, JA is losing its grip over the business affairs of their members, both some of the co-ops and certainly many, many farmers within Japan. Um, we've also seen that the number of part-time farmers uh, is decreasing in both absolute terms and relative terms. You can see from this chart that whereas in 1990 the ratio of part-time farmers to efficient full-time farmers was more than 5 to 1, it has now decreased to about 2 and a half to 1. And this reflects a number of the changes, the amalgama slow amalgamation of land um, and other innovative forms of, uh, of farming at the local level. So JA has lost its grip. The regime has lost its grip. This has given the uh, government of Japan a number of new inroads into the, uh, the process of reform. To conclude, let me just say that uh, Mr. Abe here um, driving what's called um, a rice planter. You can see the beds of rice that are going to be stuck into the paddy in a few moments. Uh, Mr. Abe isn't doing anything significantly new if we look at what's already happened. Mr. Abe is really building on precedent. Years and years of small-scale reform that have been uh, leaning toward market-oriented farming. And he is introducing reforms, JA reform being one of them, um, which are designed to accelerate those trends. Um, what he's doing is significant, but certainly not earth-shatteringly new. And to conclude, let me ask one final question. Does that mean JA or agricultural reform no longer has a debt to pay to Gaiatsu in Japan? Does that mean international issues and um, foreign pressure no longer matters in Japan? That's not what we're arguing. Um, we see that there are domestic reasons um, for reform in Japan that are very, very compelling, and that Japan no longer needs gaiatsu to engage in reform. It has its own domestic, made-in-Japan incentives, and it also has new political opportunities within Japan to engage in reform and for reformers to introduce reform over recalcitrant um, defenders of the old status quo. We do acknowledge, however, that the lure of globalization has certainly accelerated the process of change, made it more compelling, and it's kind of like the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. If Japan can continue to make its farmers more market-oriented, more sensitive to consumer demand, those farmers will be more competitive on the international stage, and if or when TPP ever sees the light of day, those farmers will also find themselves with new opportunities to sell their product, not just in Japan, but also abroad. But the days of gaiatsu in the past as the key variable in explaining Japan's change in the agriculture are, uh, the regime are certainly over. This, by the way, I thought I would end and start and end with Keishi Mizu. That is the, I didn't mean to show the backside of my, my esteemed partner, but there she is walking toward a a uh, farmer that we visited uh, in the Noto Peninsula uh, just a few weeks ago. Let me stop there. Um, I'm sure I raised more questions than I asked and, uh, uh, answered, and I welcome your feedback and questions. Thank you.